Uh, St. John chapter 9. St. John chapter 9. Everybody got it? Book of St. John chapter 9. Verses, beginning at verse 1, we'll probably read to verse 4. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And I want to use for a subject this little phrase here, taken out of verse 3, the works of God. The works of God. If you're well acquainted with the book of John, you find that it is quite interesting because it deals with the deity of Christ. His, of course, humanity is not in view in full scope, but his uh, messiahship and that he is the divine one who has taken upon human form to come to redeem mankind. So John, the apostle, uh, nails home certain uh, certain uh, ways of conveying that truth showing that Jesus has power over nature hence one of the miracles you find of the seven in the Saint John is the fact that he calmed the sea and rebuked it likewise as he has power to change things the very first miracle I should say uh, was the fact that he turned water into wine and so John gives us seven I am sayings and seven miracles uh, that correspond to Jesus' uh, place as being divine and being, of course, the Messiah. Y'all still here? And so, this here of which you read is the sixth miracle that he performs. He performs a miracle of unprecedented proportion in that there was a man that was born blind, and Jesus heals him. It's amazing. And I think it's quite interesting because how Jesus does it, every miracle in, in essence was different. You know that? There was someone else born, well he wasn't born blind, he had, he had uh, become blind. And uh, the Bible says that Jesus spit and put the spit in his eyes. And said, what do you see? He said, I see men walking as trees. Then Jesus goes from there and lays hands on him. And says, what do you see? And he saw clearly. So Jesus does it all for God's glory as the Lord, as the Father would instruct him. Every miracle is not the same. How God chooses to deliver you may not be how he chooses to deliver me. Long as we get delivered is all I care about. One other person in particular, that Jesus, in fact, what's amazing is that he's going to use spit for this man. Uh, one man was deaf and dumb. And Jesus comes and he sticks his fingers in his ears. Then he spits and touches the man's tongue with his spit. We think that's disgusting, but it's the word of life. It's Jesus Christ. Now, I doubt many people would want a man spitting on them. But Jesus has no hepatitis A. B, C, D, E, F, G. He is the wellspring of life. Living water. Hallelujah, somebody. You can, whatever you got to do, Jesus, to get the job done. You see, when you're in need, you can't, you can't manage your own miracle. If you're going to heal me, God, do it. Why you got to spit on me? I got to do what the Father told me to do. People don't like that, though. They don't like to be told the regimens that God has set up. Because it, it brings us no glory. It all glorifies God. Naaman, remember Naaman the leper? And Elisha told him, go dip in the water seven times over there in Jordan. He didn't want to do it because, hey, it's dirty water. But his, someone that, of course, that was under him said, well, if he asked you to do a great thing, you would do it. 
Wouldn't you have done it, uh, uh, Naaman? If he asked you to go to some other great lake, crystal water, you would have done it. If he asked you to go and defeat uh, somebody or to jump off of a bridge or whatever the case, you would have done it. Huh, somebody? Amen. Is that how we do sometimes? Yes. And, um, but nevertheless, he obeys. And as he went down seven times, his skin came as though it was a baby, healed from leprosy. Right. Right. Hallelujah, somebody. So what I'm trying to share with you is that Jesus, he does what he wants to do. And how he does it is all for the glory of God. But I want you to think about this. Those were people, when I think of all the miracles of Jesus, if you're ever interested in doing a, a, a little, in fact, how, how should I say, a little assignment, some research. Thank you. Just, just list the miracles of Jesus and how many people were healed in every instance, you see. You see, there are three resurrections. He resurrects Jairus' daughter. He resurrects, of course, the widow's son. He resurrects Lazarus. So there are three miracles that deal with resurrection. Ten, I think, of one instance of leprosy, how he healed the ten lepers, of course. Uh, a few fevers, I think two fevers, definitely he healed. But here, when we deal with blindness, there's a lot of space given to blindness. In fact, there are four counts of Jesus healing people that were blind. Three of those accounts, those people were not born blind, but they became blind. Are you listening? So can we do a little assignment for a moment? Do you have mine? I want you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now just stop and think for a moment, please. That as you close your eyes just now, you'll never be able to see again. If I were to describe a color to you, you would have a point of reference, wouldn't you? If I say green, you, you have seen green. You have seen blue. You've seen the ocean water. You see. You've seen mountains. You've seen airplanes in the sky and birds that fly. You can think of a pigeon. You can think of a sparrow. You've seen them. It's tormenting to think that if you lose that sight, all you have is that point of reference. But I want you to think about something. If you were born blind, no matter what I could explain to you, no matter how I could describe it, you would have not one drop or modicum of understanding what I'm saying. That's like me telling you, have you seen Unshakalaka? I don't even know what Unshakalaka is, but if I explained it to you as a color, you wouldn't know. You can open up your eyes now. Now, Jesus healed three people that once saw, but they became blind. One in particular was Bartimaeus, and he hears about Jesus. He's the only blind man that we have a name of. Bartimaeus in that he was at one time a wealthy man. His family was a family of prominence. But because of his blindness and because of religious leaders at the time, when one became blind, they said he must be cursed. So the family must have excommunicated him because of his condition. You hear what I'm telling you, church? So Bartimaeus is now brought low in a place where he has to beg. Are you listening, church? And the, the church world or the synagogue at that time said, if there's an ailment to such degree as this, then you, God must not be on your side. You would think that Bartimaeus' family would say, hey, listen here, come, our beloved son, let us take care of you. But he's, he's reduced to begging. He's reduced to hanging around the, 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 the highways with his hand out as new uh, people would enter into Jerusalem, of course, to give alms homage and to worship the Lord. He would look for their piety to, hey, here's somebody who needs some help. Let me help this man, Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus, he hears about Jesus. And he says, Thou son of David. Hallelujah, somebody. He calls out to the Lord. The Lord comes to him. And he heals him. Two other blind men, of course. The disciples tell them, Be quiet. And they cried out the more, Thou son of David. Because they were tired of being blind. They were tired of being dependent. They were tired of being restricted you see blindness is a handicap you see 
And if one does not understand the works of God, they'll blame God, become bitter, hate God's people. I mean, isn't that true? We not if, if we don't even use uh, blindness. When you're afflicted, and you can't help yourself anymore. And you thought, because you helped others in their affliction, they'd come around and help you too. But they don't want nothing to do with you. Can you imagine that now? Being reduced now to a place of dependency. Having to fend for yourself. That's torment. You listen to church? To remember what you could do but can't do anymore. Here was a man, though, that never saw. He was blind from his birth. No point of reference. No way of understanding the stories that were told in Jewish history. Or the word of God for that matter. He never saw the blue sky. Born in Stygian darkness. You see how it is? It's black, you know. But to the blind man, he can't. He doesn't know what black is. It's nothing. You see what I'm saying, church? See, we see, we close our eyes, we see it's black. But to the blind man, he can't even define black. We can tell him that, hey, what you're seeing is black, but even then we do not know what they see because they cannot describe it, you see, to its full capacity. Y'all still with me? So the works of God. You hear the disciples, they say, well, Lord, who sinned? This man or his parents? Which implies they believed in reincarnation. Because how could he sin before he was born? <laughs> how could he make a mistake or transgress God before he was born? See, you didn't exist before. You existed the moment you were conceived. So there was no sin that preceded you. Likewise, I can imagine the parents who probably question themselves as to how could this happen why was the child born blind who what what did we do to deserve this haven't you been there you sometimes you think the things that you produce they're defective they don't work properly and although you invested all into making sure things would run smoothly just by God's foreknowledge and his permissive will, it doesn't work. Are y'all all right? I'm trying to paint a picture for you first, okay? And that is, this young man, we don't know his age, lived and he would make his living with his hand out. Blind and unable to see. But amazingly enough, what I've heard about blind people is that they have this great ability to know distance. They can help people in the dark, of course, find their way. One in particular man in Africa who was born blind uh, would help the Africans or the uh, missionaries find their way to the next village in the dark. Because when it's dark, you can't see anything. But he, of course, remembered the steps what to feel for. See, all the blind man has, if you will, are his ability to feel. He can feel, but he cannot see. He has a point of reference only in that as far as, how, as he can feel the edges, if you will. Are you listening, everybody? But he's born blind. And Jesus looks at him. And what I love about this passage is that he never ask Jesus for healing. Jesus doesn't even reveal himself to the man. Are y'all listening, church? Amen. Here's the blind man, and it just so happens that the disciples make mention. God, look at this man that, that is born blind. Who did it? Why is he in this situation? Why is he in this dilemma? And Jesus says, for the glory of God, that the works of God may be manifest. Now, do we hear what, what, what Jesus said? That Jesus says that this man was born this way for the works of God to be made manifest? That's something to think about. I can cut to the chase where you are right now. 
you're put in this situation for the works of God to be made manifest. Jesus waits to the last year to heal this man. He had healed other blind people. This is the last blind person he heals. And more specifically, again, he's the only one that was born blind. Why didn't Jesus go to him the first year of his ministry? This is the last year of his ministry. In fact, the last few uh, months of his ministry, when we read John chapter 9, the last few months. Why didn't Jesus? And we say that sometimes. Jesus, can you hurry this thing up? Why wasn't I the first on the list? I heard about, maybe we don't know. Did he hear about Bartimaeus? Did he hear about those other two blind people? Did he hear about these others that God had opened their eyes? But I'm glad that you, when you read about this man, he isn't bitter. Hallelujah, somebody. He is not, of course, defeated and discouraged. Jesus comes to him. And the Bible says he spits on the ground and he makes clay mud patties and he touches his eyes some say he made eyeballs he created eyes for the man hallelujah somebody hallelujah somebody hallelujah somebody the creator can do it see the others were healed but he had a miracle because Jesus makes clay and he spits in the clay. You have the matter and the components. You have the creator there. See, Jesus, all he needs is a little matter. The matters that you got going on. Come on, somebody. Isn't, isn't clay, isn't, isn't dust matter? Come on, somebody. And from the lips of the almighty God, he makes clay balls, puts them in the man's eye and tells him to go and wash. Hallelujah, somebody. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now we never read that Jesus sent a disciple to carry him there. From where he was to Siloam was a little distance. So he received the anointing. He, was, he received the instructions over here. We sometimes think that Jesus just does it all. Why didn't he tell the disciples, go get this man some water? No, he tells the man, go and you go and wash. Hallelujah, somebody. See, many times we're lazy. If you're going to do something for me, God, do it all the way. I don't want to do nothing. I mean, have not I suffered long enough? I still, got, I, I still got to do X, Y, and Z? We do that, don't we? But this man, if you will... We're never told that he is given guidance to Siloam. He has to go there by himself. And he washes his eyes and now he's seeing for the first time. Can you imagine that now? I don't even know how to describe that. Because to a blind man, they know nothing of three dimensions or two dimensions or one dimension. Their world is surrounded and engulfed in just sound alone. They're very keen. In fact, when one sense is down, the others are magnified. So a person with, uh, they're blind, if you whisper something, they can hear you. One sense, and he was able to hear. Can you imagine what he heard all that time being blind? See, sometimes God allows things to handicap you. So you can hear some things. I ain't got no help in here today. We don't want to be handicapped. But see, God has to close our eyes and tune up the ears so that we can really hear who's on our side. Who's really praying for us. See, I can see and in my mind paint a picture of you because of the grace that you and I have for one another. But when you get down and when you get in an ailment, all you got to do is listen. Listen. Hallelujah, somebody. And so as this man makes his way, and forgive me for being so slow today because y'all seem to be a little bit tired, I guess. I pray that you hear me. 
he goes and he washes his eyes and he begins to see and now everything comes into place for the glory of God you know what I find interesting is that um, blindness is probably one of the most uh, devastating things that can befall anybody aside from being maimed dismembered and it affects their life but I'm reminded that we, in all things we ought to give thanks. In all things we ought to give God glory. I don't know this man's prayer life. I don't know, I don't know who he was. There's not enough evidence there. But I just like to believe that, that he was a man that didn't give up on God or did not blame God in this degree. The world is full of people that want to blame God. Years ago, a Jewish rabbi, when his son passed away, uh, he wrote a book. Uh, how does it go now? Uh, uh, why, why bad things happen to good people. Everybody bought, even Christian folks. The book is a good book for a doorstop, a paperweight. People believe that, and even certain uh, psychologists say, well, when you've been wronged, you have to forgive those who wronged you and they even say Tamara that you have to forgive God forgive God I mean that's probably one of the things as a Christian you may wrestle with at times as far as being angry with God I don't think you truly say if you've never been angry at God at least once in your life because you get angry with him you get upset you get if you will in your impatience because God is trying to work on it <laughs> You get frustrated really easily, don't you? And what I find is that you and I have to come to the place that we accept the cards that God deals to us. These are cards we cannot fold and say, throw them in and give me another hand. He dealt them to us, and there's a purpose. We may not see the pattern. We may not see the plan, but God gave you the lot that you have. You see, we think it's so devastating when I think of how that people are killed or innocent people are hurt or raped and we say that's horrific right but do you know that God has a plan in all of that see if you can accept that God set up for his son to be murdered and had a plan what more of this woman over here being raped there's a plan see we don't like to hear that kind of gospel but either God is sovereign of all are not sovereign at all. There was a woman back in the 1800s who, when she was, well, this little girl, when she was born, uh, she born, she was born, she could see. But the doctors put the wrong drops in her eyes. And it blinded her for the rest of her life. You listening to me, church? Her name was Fanny Crosby. And amazingly enough, as a little girl, her grandmother and her mother taught her the Bible. And she would memorize scripture, chapter upon chapter, verse upon verse. She was genuinely saved, genuinely a Christian, and she would write over 8,000 gospel songs and hymns. A hundred million of those today are copied and printed. Do you believe that? She wrote songs like, uh, let me see here, I think, uh, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, G Fanny Crosby. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Interesting, isn't it? She wrote also, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. A blind woman wrote that. But what, what struck me the most about it, Yolanda, is what she said about her blindness. Check this out. It seemed intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank God, and I thank Him for this dispensation. If perfect earthly sight were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have sung hymns to the praise of God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. 
Oh my God. She was thanking God for the blindness, y'all. And that blindness did not stop her from serving God and doing a work for Him. Hallelujah, somebody. She said, if they offered me blind, if they offered me the ability to see tomorrow, I would not accept it. Hallelujah, somebody. You got to read her autobiography. I got a few notes of something else she said. When I get to heaven, the first face that, sh that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. Hallelujah, somebody. Although I thank mama and grandmama for teaching me the Bible, I want to see Jesus. Now, most people would live the rest of their life all to, to really see bitterness. All you've simply got to do is go to the nearest convalescent home. People are bitter there. Mean, selfish, arrogant. Take this out of here, please. And to some degree, they're reaping what they sow. And you see people that once were riding high brought low. And I believe sometimes God judges them by putting no good CNAs in there to let them sit up in their soil. Although it's, a, it's wrong. And I want to fight that people be clean, yes. But it just might be the hand of God. Because maybe they didn't wipe mamas behind. You're not trying to hear me, church. You better be careful how you treat folks. Treat your children. One day you may need them. They're going to say, no, mom, we're going to put you somewhere else. How many Chinese do we see inside of convalescent homes? They're going to take care of their own. That's the heritage. In fact, children are God's social security plan. So what you fail to raise them right now is going to end up in the future. You're going to reap it really tough when they're not going to be able to help you. Too busy for you. But physical ailments and problems reveal to you and I what we're truly made up of, you see. What's in us. Amen. You know, people, they praise God when they're fine and they're healthy, but when they get down, their theology changes, their praise changes. They get mad with God. I ain't going to praise you enough. I know a pastor, of course, he has... Problem with his knees, but it never stopped him from praising God. In fact, he get to praising God and knee pain stop. Not because of his adrenaline. Come on, because oh, it's just the adrenaline. No, it's the anointing. Come on, somebody. Fanny Crosby, who wrote other songs that you and I sing, I won't mention them. I just dare you to go into go into them. A white woman, but was used in spite of her ailment. For the glory of God. And I said to myself, I would say to you this. What's your excuse? You're not blind. You've got your mental faculty. Hopefully you've got a sound mind. You've got the ability to hear and see. What's hindering you from doing the... She saw a need to write songs. She also, write, she also wrote many poems. Great woman, great to this day. She is heralded as a uh, patriarch of modern Christianity. Isn't that something, church? And she gave God the glory. What I'm trying to get to is this man receives a chance of a lifetime. He, he gets something that they didn't get in India. People are born blind all over the world. C -c -c would you not agree that this man was able to say, how blessed I am? You think about that. How blessed I am because there was some that didn't get what I got. Hallelujah, somebody. There were some that wanted it but couldn't get it. And they, they died blind. But, but you saw fit for me to see. And what shall I do with this blessing? Shall I use this blessing to defile myself? And that's the next point I wanted to make. Because, you see, many of us in here, we've been given much. But what have we done with it? So, I wanted to make a few more points. Is that all right? 
And that is, since God has opened up your eyes, since you've been saved, and God has brought you into the marvelous light, what have you done with it? I want to share with many of you in here, you've got to be careful what your eyes record. Be careful what you see and what you allow to come in. The Bible is emphatic about this, of course. And I think the scripture is well best said, Proverbs 22, verse 3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil, which means wise. Don't tell me you're wise and you don't see the evil. This means that you're circumspect. A prudent man foresees evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. So, wisdom says, I'm able to see that this is not a good situation here. So I'm going to hide myself from I'm not going to be a part of it. But if I'm simple and foolish, I'm going to just say, hey, I know, ain't no danger, no problem. I'm falling into a trap. But don't we, don't we not remember the scripture says, if the blind lead the blind? Somebody's got to see. Now can you imagine, if you were blind, how would you be able to tell if the person leading you was blind? Well, if they're, they're leading you and they fall and you fall, uh, are you sure you can see? See, one of the signs that you cannot see, you stumble and fall quite often. Uh -oh. Y'all missing with it. Y'all don't like to hear that kind of message. If you really had sight, you wouldn't sin as much as you do willfully. You will be able to see. Come on, somebody. I need some help in here today. You're blind. I'm not talking about mendacities. But a person that says, oh, I see. I'm in the church. I'm in God. I'm in Jesus. But didn't you see that trap? Didn't you see the, the, the setup? Didn't you see the snare of the devil? I mean... If you told me about it, and I can see it, and I wasn't there to see it, but when I heard it, I could see it in my mind's eye. My perception being in Christ, I can detect something don't sound right about that. Remember I was talking about some time ago, uh, we have a series about authentic Christianity. Well, this is a little part of that too. Because the real Christians, they foresee the evil. I'm not talking about the gift of wisdom, 1 Corinthians 12, no. But acquired knowledge in the word, that the very appearance of evil, we are to what? Refrain from it. And that's evil when we fail to acknowledge what God's word says and we justify what we want to do and then get say, we'll say, well, Lord, I've fallen, I can't get up, you've got to help me. Now, when I think of that, I want you to look at this here now. Matthew 6.22 says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of what? Darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Mm. The illumination of one's mind. Another sign, of course, that someone is not walking in the light. I want to use 1 John 2.11. It says, but he that hateth his brother, check this out now, he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So when you hate each other in the church, you don't know where you're going. You're, you're in the place of being able to stumble and fall. So hatred is a sign of blindness, a sign of darkness. And how can you take the beam out of my eye when your beam is bigger? God help us today. And so as I look at this here, I felt the Lord telling me to share with the people, it's time for you to open up your eyes. There needs to be a reality check. Because, see, when we close our eyes sometimes, and many times some of us are privy to daydreaming, I think most people today, Pastor James, are living in a fantasy. 
This, it's a make-believe world. It's not reality. They pretend that everything is okay. And they, you know, they just have a, a, a way of seeing life. And it's so foreign. But they have lied to themselves so much the imagery that they have becomes the truth. But I want to see. I, I want to see and clearly see. I wouldn't want anybody who is going to do surgery on me who needs glasses, of course, and if they don't wear them that day. And we, you and I, have been given an opportunity to see, and we do not, of course, allow the Holy Spirit to function in that area of perception. Because the perception deals, of course, with the root word perceive, how I perceive things. But if my eye is evil, one of the signs of an evil eye, somebody can be trying to do good by you and be nice to you, but you have a way of looking at them that something is up. That's an evil eye. And you find that most with Christian folks. Somebody's always up to something. Well, who can, can you trust anybody like that? No wonder we hate because we don't trust. No wonder we scandalize and we criticize because there's no trust there. Because we have an evil eye. An evil eye implies that you can see, but you choose what you see. You limit yourself in seeing what your carnal mind wants you to believe. If I could say it another way, you read into things that are just not there. Are you listening, church? And I've seen this over and over again, how people can doctor up and they can, you know, set up all kinds of scenarios. And it's far from the truth. Well, well you don't like me. Well, I just happened to be busy that day. So I didn't shake your hand. Do I not have a right to be busy? But when you do it, I don't question your love. I realize that you might be going through something. Huh? Are we biased that way? We, we see things the way we want to see it. You know what, all, what I love about the Bible and about how, how Jesus dealt with people? Ailments and sins unite people. Did not the ten lepers hang out? There was one stranger amongst nine Jews. Now, there were nine lepers that were Jews and one that was a stranger, Pastor James. Had they all been healed, those nine would never have anything to do with that stranger. But because they were all lepers, we're in the same boat. Likewise, blind. Blindness, and it's sad when you get people that are just as blind as you looking at parts and trying to make a whole picture. Well, did you see that? Oh, I saw that too. And all of them wrong. Come on, somebody. All of them blind. All Five people blind talking about putting a picture together? So you got to be careful of who you receive revelation from if they're not walking circumspectly. That's why I do not take advice from people who have an evil eye. If their track record is suspect, their walk with Christ is suspect, their revelations from God are suspect. I mean, they can't discern who's speaking through them. You see. And it's always tempered with how they feel, never by what God is saying. Remember I told you, a blind man relies upon feeling. So we got people that, of course, and I've seen this. Are you listening, everybody? That can barely see, and they use a combination of a little bit of what they see and what they feel. So when they interpret things, they see things vaguely but they get their confirmation by how they feel nobody getting what I'm saying today but I'll tell you hmm I can be, it's, it's black that's true 
Truth mixed with feelings will never produce the truth. That's why your feelings <laughs> are not the foundation for truth. While I feel, I think, I perceive. Be careful. Church. Y'all don't want to hear what I'm saying today. This man was born blind. And he was, of course, now being able to see and being able to uh, function in life. And do you know that when the people that, of course, when I think of this, this miracle is given much space. In fact, the entire chapter uh, chapter 9 is given to what takes place in this man's life because once he's healed and he goes to give God glory the people that knew him his neighbors wanted the Pharisees to evaluate the miracle Jesus healed you no you know he's a sinner <laughs> he, if he was going to heal you he wouldn't heal you on the Sabbath day so they go to people who Jesus would say are blind to interpret his situation. You can't expect people who are blind to interpret anything. Are you hearing me, church? Father God, please help me to say this the way you want me to say it. They had already made up their mind about Jesus. You mean to tell us that the, the wine bibbler healed you? The drunkard healed you? The blasphemer healed you? Do you know he's a sinner? They would tell him. And he would say this, hey, whether he be a sinner or no, I don't know. But one thing I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. And I know that we know that God would not even allow such a thing to happen. The man knows that since the beginning of the world, no one had ever been healed or uh, received their sight after they were born blind. No one in the world. He was the first man in the recorded history that ever received sight. Being born blind. So do you know in, in chapter 9, we didn't read all of this, but they start arguing with this man. They threaten his mother and father that if anybody were to confess Jesus as Christ, they would be kicked out. <laughs> but the man doesn't care because the synagogue wasn't there to help me in the first place. Come on, somebody. Jesus came along and helped me. He's the first person to be kicked out of the synagogue because of the miracle of God that was performed. And sometimes what God does for us and how he does it will not be so easily readily received by those who claim to know God. Are you listening, church? Because they in their mind, they think that if God's going to do it, he's going to do it according to their regimen, their stipulations. They're, of course, amazing. It's, it's something. But this man goes on to receive his sight, and amazingly enough, as I said before, he never asked Jesus, didn't even know who Jesus was. And when Jesus hears that the man has been, uh, has been put out the church, Jesus comes to him and asks him, do you believe on the Son of God? The man says, who is he that I might believe? Hallelujah, somebody. Which in this case, which is so interesting, Jesus did not come to this man with a sermon. Hallelujah, somebody. See, some people, they don't need to hear a sermon from you. They need to experience the power of God through you. Come on, somebody. Don't give me a long lecture about God as a healer and a miracle worker. Let's see it. Now, that's in every case. Some people need to be preached to. But see, Jesus did this thing. I love the way he works. He works tactfully. He blesses people, then comes back with the, the greater blessing. Come on, somebody. For I think it's greater to see spiritually and to be illuminated in Christ, knowing he is the way, the truth, and the life. That is greater. You see, we think of him being uh, healed of his blindness as the greatest thing that ever happened to him. No. The greatest thing that ever happened to this blind man is that he accepted Jesus Christ. So he isn't like most people. Lord, I'll accept your miracles, but not you. No, I want, thank you for the miracle, but I want you more than the miracle. Even if I go blind again, long as I know you, I'll be all right. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to allow anything to keep me from seeing you. 
Why? Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And faith, hearing, faith in the word of God is greater than anything you can see tangibly with your natural eyes. Are you listening, everybody? And so when I think of the power of God and how he had manifested to this man, thinking of the whole providence of God and how God in our life has set up these, uh, if you will, dominoes to, to fall down when we accidentally bump. You know how sometimes you can make one mistake or one sin and it just starts a chain reaction. But we've got to remember who set up the dominoes. Because if we don't believe that God is in control of all, then we can never say that all things work together for the good. My situation, your situation, your life, the way it is, is all put in place by God. You were born where God wanted you to be born. You know that? If your daddy was a whole, he was a whole, and God allowed him to produce you. We don't like those phrases, but everything that you experience in your life was done to make you what you are now by the glory of God. You have to see the providence of God, the hand of God. A dear brother spoke about how that when he debates and he goes to Muslim universities and they threaten to kill him, Deacon James. They threaten to kill his family, rape his daughter up. He says, don't even move me. Because I come from a house where I heard about murder every day. Yes, Hear what I'm telling you, church? Look at your life. Now, this is what I'm trying to get to when I say the works of God. I don't know how old this man was. But he was a man, which implies he's over 20. And his parents were where they were. I don't know if they gave up on him. I don't know. But God allowed him to be put in that situation for all those years for his glory look at your life and start putting the pieces together hopefully you can see the hand of God and how he has funneled you made you what you are he put people around you he put you you just weren't born in California God saw fit that you were born in California God saw fit that your family would struggle if you were like me at that time, of course, eating top ramen and bologna. But he saw fit to do that. He did it. He set it up. Now, you were born. Let me say it like that. Thank God you weren't born a sea cucumber. Because the same place he eats, he takes a dump. I wouldn't want to be a sea cucumber. But God made you who you are, what you are, you are how God designed you to be. As the word of God says, fearfully and wonderfully made. Your hair, your height, your weight, believe it or not. God help us. See, we've got to remember God is in control of all. That doesn't mean we're not responsible for not taking care of ourselves. Yes, we are. But God set it up for us. You are in God's, in his providence, and his foreknowledge. He knows it all. Check this out. I wanted to read to you about God's, uh, about his providence. It's universal. It's purposeful. But I love this part here in, 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 in Daniel because it, it speaks of, of God's providence being irresistible. Nebuchadnezzar, who God would bring down, didn't he bring him down? Would write this in his testimony. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth, speaking of God, according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand no one can stop him or say unto him what doest thou no one know. he's beyond you can't figure him out that's why you're gonna learn for the rest of your life about you and him you'll ask the questions why and it won't be like us preachers that fail to answer them because he has all knowledge and he will explain the reasons why so again, if we can accept this man was born blind, if we can accept that people are horrifically murdered or raped, then we should also be able to accept that Christ died on the cross and God set that up, y'all. Hence the scripture says it, 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 it pleased God to bruise him. 
So if the greatest atrocity to the Godhead could be, of course, uh, uh, taken, you know, uh, displayed, what more then of our life and the tragedies that take place? All for the, and we don't want to accept that, church. But everything, God is going to get glory. Even out of the evil. Even out of the good. He's going to get glory. Because his works are going to be made manifest. Nothing can stay his hand. I don't know how to reconcile that when sometimes God requires you and I to believe. But God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. And you can't stop him. See, we sometimes, we mess this up. When we say, oh, God is a gentleman. Well, that isn't the, the case in the Bible. Where was that gentleman when he destroyed all the earth in Noah's flood? Where was that gentleman when the earth opened underneath Korah and his family? See, God does what he wants. To. He's gentle. But as we think of him just, just letting you cuss him out, and raise yourself up. What about King Herod when he was exalted and the people, of course, were venerating him. And the angel sat next to him and just said, you fool. And slapped him and worms ate him from the inside out. See, God is in control. This man we don't hear too much more about. But it's a miracle designed for you and I to see the power and the providence and the works of God being made manifest. Even after, as we think, it's delayed. Let me say this. God is never, he is never late. He's never late. It's always when he has given the word. He knows what's best. I, I don't think we heard what I said earlier, but I'm going to say it again. Jesus didn't go and use him as the first miracle. I mean, the first miracle Jesus performs is, is, is in, in a closed setting. Only a few people knew that he turned the water into wine. But on the sixth miracle, everybody knew about this. Because everybody knew the man was blind. They saw him for years. We know he's blind. How was he able to see now? We know he, he ain't never seen us. He's never, he's never worked a day in his life besides begging. But then those seven miracles, each one gets greater and greater. The next miracle after this miracle is when Jesus resurrects Lazarus after four days but there was a precursor to Lazarus there was this man that everybody knew so God takes a man that was blind that everybody knew and heals him then he takes a man that was dead that everybody knew and resurrects him come on somebody so let them talk about you let them let them run you in the ground God has allowed them to come against you because when he exalts you, everybody's going to know. Hallelujah, somebody. He's, everybody's going to know. I know that you. Can you imagine the sailors that when they got back to Israel and they saw Jonah, the last thing they saw was him drowning. Come on, somebody. But they had no idea God prepared a fish. I ain't got no help in here today, church. Sometimes God allows you to be thrown and cast over. He allows you to get your feet very wet. He allows your health to deteriorate, your finances to crumble, your love life uh, be cracked up, whatever the case may be. For His glory. Because there was no hope for the blind man. As people have said about this ministry, and about yours truly. There's no hope for it to be resurrected. It's going to stay dead. No. See, when Lazarus, he was dead for four days, which means his body began to stink. Sometimes God allows our situation to stink. And everybody smells it. But then he comes and makes it all new. Father, help your people today. Help them to understand what you're saying to this ministry. That you want us to see. Now, as I've, I've taught that, I'd like to be a little charismatic with you. Because we've got too many partially blind people here. 
The word of God says, believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. I'm, I'm not sure if it's 1 Kings 20, 20 or 2 Chronicles. It's, it's, it's one of those scriptures that's 20, 20. Which I think that's interesting because we are to have 2020 vision. And then I thought about it a little bit more because this is the first day of the ninth month. And this is chapter 9 of St. John. Now, when you go to get your license, and hopefully you didn't have no tickets, and you, of course, are able to just to come in and do the testing with your eyes, you know, they look to see, can you see? Read that line over there. Even though you took the test years ago, the driving test, you may be good at all that, but if you can't see how to operate that car, if you misread the signals, and they're looking to see if you're going to misread the signal, uh, uh, the signs, because you might need to get over, and you're in the fast lane, you should have got over a long time ago. What I'm trying to share with you is simply this. Many of you in here are not reading the signs accurately. You're in the fast lane, and your stop is over here. You get pulled over, you're going 70 miles in a 35 mile per hour zone. I thought it said 70. Sir, the sign says 35 miles per hour. When someone cannot see clearly, the vision is blurred. And letters and numbers become something different. That's why I said God wants this ministry. These people, you're here today because God wanted you to be here. He wants you to open up your eyes. What are you failing to see? Many people in here, you major. Well, let me say here and say it this way: you, you, you've got it. You know. How can I say it here? Well, we have to deal with the more weightier matters. The Pharisees were rebuked because they were blind. More specifically, he says, hey, yeah, you, you, you pay your tithe. Yeah, you, you, you do come to the synagogue. And yes, you, you do that, but you've omitted the more weightier matters of justice. Come on, somebody. And mercy. So these things over here you've got, but you have omitted the, more thing, the things that are more important over here. Why? Because you really can't see. See, what you overemphasize many times blind you to see even more important things. Because we're so wrapped up in this over here, we don't see. I hope this is making sense to somebody. If this has your attention, and it is important, but it's not the only thing important. Hence, we spoke about, I think I just briefly touched on a little bit, about your eye being single. You see the end of things. But those who have eyes that are not single, have, they see many opportunities, many avenues that are vain. We are to look at things linear, perpetually. And I just want to share with you, please, Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, that he wants to give them eye salve. What? To heal their eyes. Because they weren't seen clearly. This ministry needs some eye salve from Jesus. Heal my eyes that I might be able to see. That I might be able to discern. That I might be able to know. I'll be the first to say here I am Lord. Heal my eyes that I can see. Father, today we thank you for your word today. And we honor you for your grace and your mercy. And those that have come, O oh God, that need to be healed. Touch our vision, O oh God. Help us to see this path. Mm. 
Your word is a light unto our uh, our feet and a, a lamp unto our path, something along those lines. A lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, something along those lines. To my feet and a to my all right. And so as the Lord is lighting up, will you see the light and walk in the path of righteousness, or will you willfully be blind? I think the worst thing is a, is a person that, that chooses not to see, that can see. That chooses not to see. I don't want to deal with that, so I refuse to see it or to acknowledge it. To see something and fail to acknowledge as a problem, you, you're worse than someone. You should be blind. Because then it would be better for you to be blind. Everybody, when you get a chance, please read what Jesus tells the man. That <laughs> those who claim to see, they're blind. Their sin remains. But he's come to give sight to those that are blind, spiritually speaking. And so, God lets people stay blind. Amazingly enough, he sets it up that way. Because they refuse to acknowledge that they're blind. The Pharisees say, oh yeah, we see, we understand, we, we know the Bible, we got it all together. Jesus said, no, you're blind. Some of you in here today are blind to see your children, blind to see your relationship with God, blind to see your close relatives. The most terrible blindness is, I think, failure to see you when you open the Word of God. A blind man can look in the mirror all day and won't know he needs a shave unless he feels for it. Won't know that there's a hair out of place. You know that? The Word is as a mirror. Is that not right? We behold our face as in a glass. But we soon forget. We open the Bible. I don't. I, sh, I see me every day. I read the Bible. And the more He helps my eyes to see 2020, the more clarity, the more definition I see in me that should be redefined. Father, help us today in Jesus' name. We pray. Somebody say, Praise God.